Jesus, <laughs> by your Holy Spirit, please come in, take over, and take charge. Remove every distraction, set things in order, Lord, so that you alone are glorified and so that every misstep is corrected by your grace and by your power. Lord, usher us into your presence. Keep us there. Fill us with your word. And as always, we do ask for conviction. We ask for challenge. We ask for change. We ask to be broken, edified, and built up. For your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so last night, we were here last night, right? Yep. We had an awesome dinner. <laughs> it was awesome. It was good. Had some um, green Gerber food baby stuff that I've never had before. So if you missed it, you can see Willie for the recipe. <laughs> All right, so we're in Numbers, chapter 20, verse 14 through 21, 9. This is entitled, um, Memory? Yeah, that's what I said. Do we have it today? Oh, you said no. Well, communion efficacy. Okay. Wait, we're going to take a pause. We're kind of all over the place. Like I said, just pray for us today. <laughs> Bernard is going to bless us with communion today. Kimberly, shh, 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 shh. Can I, have a, can I have a bottle of water? Okay, so we're not having communion today. Thank you. All right. Okay, so peanut gallery. Don't yell any more commands to me because I don't know what's going on. Oh my gosh, you guys are so unprofessional. <laughs> you in that crazy church on a hill? <laughs> Put the lights on. <laughs> okay. Oh my We're here today in Spring Valley <laughs> on the planet Earth. <laughs> when I was in a the hospital, they used to come wake me up like every so many hours and be like, hello, Mr. Kyle, you are in the hospital. You were shot five times. I know I'm here. You don't have to tell me. So we're here today and we are going to get started. So we're in numbers 14. Thank you, Lord. Again, you know, the ministry is messy because you're dealing with real people and real people do not have it together all the time. Each one of you know how crazy you are in your own head, right? Yeah. And for the most part, we can always keep it contained. But today it seems to be let loose and it's all out here. But we're going to get through this because God is able, right? All right. So numbers 20. Verse 14 through 21, 9. This is entitled, Entitled or Grateful? And this is a question we have to ask ourselves. Am I entitled or am I grateful? Okay, so, 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 you guys remember last week, um, Moses and Aaron went on top of the rock that God told them to speak to with the rod of resurrection in their hand. Well, Moses' hand, but Aaron was there. And Moses said, all right, you moron rebels, you want some water? And he struck the rock. Bam, bam. Water came out, and God said, because of that, you two will not go into the promised land. And we learned that they had violated the authority and the position of God. 
because God said, do this. And they're like, we're going to do that with a bad attitude. And God said, just for that, not just for that, but because of that, because you misrepresented me, because you communicated that I was angry with the people and spiritually you communicated that my salvation is not complete and total, you will not enter the promised land. So if you don't remember all of that, you can go back and listen to the message from last week. All right. So are we caught up to where we are right now? All right. Chapter 20, verse 14. So after they get their 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 um, sentence, punishment, judgment for striking the rock, it says, Now Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom, saying, Thus says your brother Israel, You know all the hardship that has befallen us, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians afflicted, Afflicted, afflicted us and our fathers. When we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent his angel and brought us up out of Egypt. And now here we are in Kadesh, Kadesh on a city, at a city, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through the fields are the vineyards, nor will we drink water from the wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn us we will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. Okay, so remember they've wandered around in the in the wilderness for just 38 years, and now God has brought them back full circle to the place where they refuse to go and cross the land. So they're back at go. And they're at the they're at Kadesh Barnea where they where they got turned back last time and had to wander 40 years and they're at the border of Edom. Okay. And so in order to get into the promised land, the shortest route would be through Edom. Okay. Today, on a map, the geographical location of Edom is modern day. Jordan. Now, we don't have, I don't have any maps, but is, um, Egypt would be southwest to the nation of Israel. When they were going to conquer the land, they came in from the east across the Jordan. They didn't come in from the west because the west is the Mediterranean Sea, I think. Anyway, so they had to come around and come east to get in. But in order to reach that, they had to go through Edom. Okay? Now, Edom is on Israel's eastern border. It bordered with uh, Judah, the tribe of Judah's allotment of land. Now, remember, the nation of Edom is from the descendants of Esau. And Esau and Jacob were twin brothers. Okay? So you guys remember, um, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Right? Okay. But years prior to the Lord changing his name, in fact, while Esau and Jacob were still in their mother's womb, God promised that his blessing would be upon Jacob and not Esau. Anyway, when they were born, Esau was born first, and normally the blessing was handed down to the firstborn. But God had already made the covenant with Jacob. Anyway, when they grew up, as they grew up, they were kind of growing in two different directions. Remember, uh, Jacob was was like he was like schemy. He was shysty. He was he was a slickster. Right. But underneath all of that, his heart was really right with God. Esau, on the other hand, he he, he could care less about spiritual things. He only cared about material things. And so there was the blessing and the birthright. The birthright was the inheritance of the spiritual blessing that would be handed handed down, meaning that by the birthright, he would become the new spiritual head of the clan of the family, right? But he could care less about the birthright. So one day he's out hunting and he's like hungry and he comes back and 
you know, in my mind, I think Jacob knew he was going to come back hungry. So he's making this soup because he's like, dude, don't care about nothing but his flesh. Right. So he's making this soup and Esau comes back. He's like, I'm going to starve to death if I can't have some of that soup. OK, wait a minute. You're Abraham's kids, grandkids, one of the richest families on the planet. You were not going to starve. Right. But shiesty Jacob says, if you give me your birthright, I'll give you a bowl of soup. And Esau's like, I don't care about no stupid birthright. Give me the soup. So he sold his birthright, which is the spiritual blessing, for a bowl of red soup. Well, later, when everybody thought their dad, Isaac, was about to die and he was blind, Jacob and his mama pulled a shiesty move and, you know, tricked their father into thinking that Jacob was Esau. So Isaac blessed Jacob with the blessing. Now, the blessing was the material side of the inheritance, meaning all the cattle, the land, everything went to Jacob. That made Esau mad. He didn't care about the birthright. He cared about the money. I don't know if you guys know anybody like that, you know. Forget the spiritual. Give me the pocket, right? <laughs> So anyway, Esau was mad and he wanted to kill Jacob. So Jacob had to run away. You guys remember all this from, from Genesis. Anyway, they had an uncle named Ishmael. Okay? Abraham was the grandfather. Abraham had a son named Ishmael. And God said, my blessing isn't with Ishmael. It's with your second son, Isaac. So another son that was born for first wasn't chosen by God. Okay. So Ishmael's descendants and I Esau's descendants got together and they hate Israel. And Ishmael is the father is the, of the father of the Muslims. Anyway, we're going to look at Ammon and, and, and Moab, but Ammon and Moab they came from Abraham's nephew, Lot. Lot also had an issue with following Abraham, so he was kicked out, right? So you have Ammon, Moab, Ishmael, and Esau. They all kind of merged together against Israel because that was God's chosen people, chosen nation out of the family, right? I don't know how to, I guess I could put it like this. You got five kids in the house and one kid inherits everything. All the other kids hate them, right? But if they go with the order that God put in place, everybody's blessed because God has an order. And that's just because he's God and he can choose who he wants to choose. All right. So you guys following that right there? Okay. So they all opposed Israel as God's chosen people. And eventually, like I said, they all combined. And since Esau and Israel were twin brothers, Moses appeals to Edom on the basis of them being family, saying, thus says your brother Israel. And then he rehearses all of Israel's history up to this point, And then he respectfully asks permission to pass through Edom's territory, right? You guys got it? Yeah. Okay, okay. Verse 18. Then Edom said to him, that is Israel, you shall not pass through my land, lest I come out against you with the sword. So the children of Israel sent back a message saying, we will go by the highway, and if I or my livestock drink any of your water, then we will pay for it. Only let me pass through on foot, nothing more. And then Edom responded. And this is nations talking, okay? So don't, anyway, you shall not pass through. So Edom came out against Israel with many men and with a strong hand. Okay. Moses respectively, respected, respectively asked permission to go through the land. Hebrews 12, 14 tells us, pursue peace with all peace with all people 
in holiness without which anyone will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Then it says this, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, for who, for one morsel of food, sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought diligently for it with tears. All right. Esau rejected the birthright. But when he lost the blessing, he wailed and cried and he just wanted the blessing. And it says he couldn't find a place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Now, it doesn't mean he tried to repent and God rejected him. It meant that he was grieved because of what he lost. He didn't have a repentant heart on a spiritual level. He was just sorry about what didn't go his way. OK, and so if you are sorry about what happened, the outcome, you didn't get your way and you're like, oh, God, I'm sorry. But it's not that I'm really sorry. It's just I don't like the circumstances. There's no place of repentance. See, God, God isn't fooled with the phony apologies. You know how like two little kids are fighting and you'd be like, tell your brother, sorry, sorry. OK, well, God knows you don't mean it. You just had to say it right But Esau was filled with bitterness. He hated his brother Jacob, Israel, for the blessing, for the birthright, because he wasn't the chosen one to inherit the blessing. And that bitterness carried down through his descendants. Okay? So remember, at this point, this is like mm, over 500 years later. And the, the nation of Edom, which is the descendants of Esau, have that bitterness towards Israel. And so when Israel came to him, it was like, listen, you, you know our story. You know how we were slaves in Egypt and everything God did for us. Can we get through the land? And they're like, no, if you come through, we're going to uh, attack you. So his descendants were still built, um, filled with that bitterness. Now, Moses said, listen, We'll buy whatever we use, if we use anything. The Edomites would have gladly taken Israel's money. But they wouldn't do so if it meant helping Israel. In other words, yeah, you may need food, you may need water, but I ain't going to sell it to you because that's going to help you. Right? Now, if I could beat you up and rob you and take your money, that's cool. But to help you? It's not going to happen. If you look at the world today, it's amazing how Israel, Israel's enemies, their attitudes have never changed. Never changed. The so-called Palestinians complain about Israel. Israel said, okay, listen, check this out. We'll give you guys some land full of, of um, what do you call those things where you grow food? Just those, the plastic things, the, the, the greenhouses. Yeah. Anyway, they had these greenhouses that Israel, because Israel grows like all kinds of food and everything. They said, we'll give you the land. We'll kick out our own citizens from their houses, leave their houses, leave all the agricultural technology and everything. We just want peace. So they made all their citizens move out Gave that stuff to the so-called Palestinians. And you know what they did? They destroyed all of it. And then put rocket launchers there. Because their attitude is this. There can be no Jews on the planet. We're going to drive you into the sea. So they came out against Israel with a strong hand. Verse 21, thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away. Now, many commentators teach this. 
They teach that Moses was acting in disobedience by trying to pass through Edom instead of following the cloud. Because if he had been following the cloud, God would have made a way possible for Israel to pass through Edom's territory. But I absolutely, totally disagree with that view. Moses was following the cloud. But God is always dealing with every piece on the board. See, on one hand, he was giving Edom an opportunity to bless God's chosen nation of Israel. He said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. On the other hand, this was Moses opportunity to act in obedience right after his act of disobedience when he struck the rock. See, Moses was following the cloud like he had always followed the cloud. But the Lord had also gave him strict instructions concerning Edom. In Deuteronomy 2.2, 2, it says this. And Moses is rehearsing what's going on. And he says, then at last the Lord said to me, you have been wandering around. You have skirted this mountain long enough. Turn northward and command the people saying, you are about to pass through the territory of your brethren the descendants of Esau, the, Edomite, <clears throat> the Edomites, who lived on Mount Sir, they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as one footstep, because I have given Mount Sir to Esau as a possession. Mm. If you need food to eat, or water to drink, you shall buy food from them with money that you may eat, and you may also buy water from them with money that you may drink. God told him, look, you've been wandering around in the desert for 38 years, now it's time to get up and go. And you're about to go through your brother Edom's territory. But don't touch him. Don't do anything to them. Because they are descendants of Abraham. And I have given them this portion of land. So they were following the cloud. But this was on Edom to decide what they were going to do. Israel's army at this time was over a half million strong. They could have simply just ran over the Edomites. Right? And went straight through their territory. But God had already commanded them that Edom was not to be touched. See, Edom was not on the list of nations that the Lord said to conquer. And since they didn't attack, Moses had no choice but to follow the cloud on a detour. And then they had to go in a southeasterly direction. Is that making sense? All right. So Edom chose not to bless God's chosen nation. And as a result, they set themselves on a course of always coming against Israel whenever that opportunity presented itself. And as a result, Edom brought upon them own self the Lord's judgment. In Obadiah 1.9, it says this. The Lord is saying, he says, To the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter, that is, wiped out by slaughter, for the violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. And he says this on the day that you stood on the other side, meaning with Israel's enemies in the day that the strangers carried off Israel's forces. When foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were one of them. Edom always aligned itself up with the nations who attacked Israel. And when Israel was attacked and Israelite refugees flew to um, try to flee to Edom, the Edomites would slaughter them as they crossed the border. Amos 1.11 reads this. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Because he pursued his brother with the sword. He cast off all pity 
His anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. Remember, Esau had bitterness towards Israel. And then in Malachi 1, 2, God pronounced, Was this not Esau, Jacob's brother? Yet, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And people say, well, that's jacked up. But remember, God is outside of time. Even before they were born, he knew what Esau was going to do. So he said, Jacob I love, and Esau I've hated. Even before they did anything wrong, because God already knew the end. And then he says, and I laid waste to his mountains and his heritage and the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and rebuild the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may rebuild, but I will throw it down. They shall be called a territory of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Yeah. Your eyes shall see and you shall say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. That was God's judgment on Edom. Wow. So, as they are about to head towards the promised land, they're marching. Edom says, no, you can't. Verse 22. Now the children of Israel, the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron in, in Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land, which I have given to the children of Israel, because you rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. All right, so now God is making it perfectly clear that Moses was not acting alone in his rebellion and unbelief when he struck the rock. Aaron was standing right there with him in complete agreement. So the Lord says to Moses and Aaron that Aaron will die because both of you rebelled against me. But check this out. In verse 24, God said this. Aaron is going to die, but through death, Aaron shall be gathered to his people. And what that means is Aaron will join all of his believing ancestors along with every other believer who has ever lived and has passed on before him into paradise. And when we look at that by application, Hebrews 12, 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Okay, so Hebrews 12, 1 comes right after Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 goes through this whole list called the Hall of Faith of all of these people who lived and died in faith and went on to live with God in glory. And when we are in our walk on earth, sometimes it gets discouraging. Sometimes it gets distracting. Sometimes it's just outright check out. Like God said, don't do that. Don't touch that. I'm about to get a whole big giant piece of it and run off and hope I don't get caught, right? But it says... We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses of faith. So don't get discouraged. Don't get distracted. Lay aside every weight and every sin. Now, there's a difference between weights and sins. Some things in our lives are not a sin. They're just a drag, right? And we pick them up. And God is saying, let that go. 
Okay, but those things about those weights, we can turn those weights into sin. Because once God says, hey, that's a drag, let it go. And you're like, no, I'm not. Okay, now it has become a sin. You get what I'm saying? And you're like, God be like, let that go. Oh, bro. I can't let that one go back there. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Right, let it go. He like it, 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 the monkey. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like the monkey. You know, check this out. Okay, remember I was telling you guys, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, that 90% of the church is standing on one side of issues and things with the Lord. 10% of those who call themselves Christians are standing against the 90% of the church, but they're in alignment with the world. Okay. When your Christianity is pleasing to the world, it's time to check yourself and spend some time in Galatians 1 because that is not the gospel of Christ. That's the gospel of demons. When the world is patting you on your back because you're the kind of Christian I like, you're not the right kind of Christian that God likes. Okay? Now, 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 check this out. The world has all sorts of ways to creep into the church so that the church, and I stole this from this preacher I saw that woke me up on YouTube yesterday, has a way, like the candy man, to make the world taste good, right? And there's all kinds of things that people say, they say that they're Christians, but they're holding on to the world. You cannot be a follower of Christ and exalt your skin color. You cannot be a follower of Christ and exalt your prestige, your possessions, your social status. God is in none of that. I mean, the devil always says, I'll give you these things if you bow down and worship me. Right? Right? You want to be glorified for the color of your skin, like you chose your parents. You want to be glorified for the money that you got? It's a dead tree. You want to be glorified for the letters behind your name? So what? I mean, think about it. You die, you go to heaven. Lord, I am Dr. Professor La La La. <laughs> I mean, God is like, what? Really? I'm so impressed. Back to life. Back to life. Back to life. Anyway, when your Christianity is blessed by the world, it's not Christianity. So lay aside every weight and every sin that easily ensnares you. And, 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 you know, for me, my big thing is this. How can you be proud of the color of your skin? You didn't choose your parents. I mean, you didn't choose your parents. And a lot of us, if we had the choice, it wouldn't have been them. <laughs> Anyway, but I'm, I'm going to stick to the notes where I get myself in trouble. <laughs> <sighs> so lay aside every sin and wait. Now, the devil does this. You know, the, the monkey and in, 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 if you guys don't know the monkey thing, I'll tell you the monkey thing. Hunters in the, in the jungle, when they want to catch a monkey, the monkeys are fast, right? But the monkeys are good. They like to eat them. I don't know why monkey meat is good, but they want to eat the monkey, right? Mm -hmm. So they get a coconut. Put a little shiny pebble inside the, the coconut that's hollowed out, tie it down. And then the monkey, he's like, ha ha, I'm going to get that little shiny rock. And he sticks his hand in there, makes a fist, and then he's stuck. 
Then he starts screaming. <laughs> but he won't let it go. And now he's screaming. He done told a hunter, here I am. And he gets clumped in the head and gets ate. We hold on to these things like that monkey. Because the devil say, put your hand in there and get it. So let it go. Because that weight becomes a sin. And you know the wages of sin is death. Verse 25. So God's speaking to Aaron, Moses and he says, take Aaron and his son Eleazar and bring them to Mount Hor and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar his son for Aaron shall be gathered to his people and die there. So Moses did just as the Lord commanded and they went up to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar his son and Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. Okay, so when I was first reading this, um, I was wondering if Moses had to strip Aaron of his priestly robes while he was still alive and put them on Eleazar because contact with human death would defile the garments and then the new high priest would be disqualified from his office. So I'm reading and I'm, I'm studying and, and then I find out in Leviticus 21, 1, it says, The Lord says to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None of them shall defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, and also his virgin sister who has had no husband. For her he may be defiled. But... Eleazar was not one of the chief priests. He was the incoming high priest. Leviticus 21.10 says this, He who was high priest among his brethren, on whose head is the anointing oil was poured, and who was consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor tear his clothes, nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself, even for his father or his mother. So the high priest could not come in contact with a dead human. So he had to strip him while he was still alive. The transfer of the priesthood from Aaron to Eleazar was a living priesthood. Now, although the Lord's human instrument would die, the living office and the work of the ministry had to go on. This is why whatever ministry that we have, that we've been blessed to serve in, the ministry is not mine. The ministry is God's. Therefore, I have no right to be territorial over it. And whatever ministry it is, it should be built like a baton ready to be passed on and handed off. This is the reason why me personally, I heavily emphasize discipling people and raise them up. Because the servant of God will move on, but the ministry to the Lord's people remains. When you go to a job, when you're working with a corporation, a company, no one person has a position that nobody else knows how to do. Because everybody's expendable. Somebody's going to fill it, right? It's like shark teeth. One falls out, another one comes in. Well, this is exactly the same way as the ministry. But for some reason in church, people think that the ministry is now mine and the sheep belong to me and everybody should be conformed to my will. And if you lead a church, you're going to hell. So you got to stay with me. That is not God. The ministry is the Lord's. And, and, and when you get into a ministry, yeah, you serve it to the best of your ability, 
but you 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 do it in a way that it can be passed off. But it can't be passed off unless someone is discipled. So the whole time you're serving, you're also raising someone else up because as they move up, you move up. And I don't mean up as in higher status, but God is always moving us. And so we have to, it don't belong to me. It's hard enough with me. I don't want to, I mean, good gosh. I just want to give it back to God in good condition. You know what I mean? That's it. Just, you know, as believers, we should leave whatever it is better than it was when we came. Period. Because it don't belong to me. And if you think it does belong to you, just tell the Lord he can't take it. Christ's priesthood is eternal. And the Holy Spirit's eternal ministry on earth is carried out all through time through the believers being passed down through time. See, the Holy Spirit is eternal, but we're not. Think about it. If the church was going to end with the apostles, none of us would be here. The ministry keeps passing on because the Holy Spirit is eternal. Now, when I say that, please don't think I'm talking about the ministry being passed on that the apostleship is being passed down because that's like the Catholic Church. You know, that's how you get the popes because they say they have the authority of Scripture. That's not what I mean. The ministry itself continues on. You pass it to your kids. They pass it to their kids. Whatever you do in life is a baton. You ever meet a, 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 a family where the parents are criminals? Oh, yeah. And then the kids are criminals? Yeah. This has been passed on, mm-hmm. right? Then they get that one oddball kid that's like, I'm going to be a cop. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then this side of the family is going this way, and this side yeah. of the family is going that way, right? Okay, so it's just passed on. So verse 29. Now when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, all the house of Israel mourned for Aaron 30 days. Aaron's life shows us that the office is more important than the man. Nobody's relationship with the God of Israel was dependent upon Aaron. It was dependent upon the high priest, the office of the priesthood. Now, in spite of that, nonetheless, the whole nation, the people, they mourn for a month over Aaron. Got to remember, Aaron was their high priest. It was Aaron who sat with them in the moments of trial, in the moments of pain, in the moments of shame. It was Aaron who prayed with them and interceded for them. Aaron, the high priest, was their tangible comfort of God when they had sinned and had to bring a sacrifice for an offering. Sometimes you need Jesus with some flesh on him, right? You're like, I believe in the Lord, but Lord, then God will send you somebody, and it's like Jesus with some flesh on him. I mean, think about it. How many people felt the Lord's cleansing and comfort and, and his peace wash over them when Aaron held their hand and told them, be of good cheer. The Lord has accepted you. And your sacrifice. You know what I mean? Just think you done messed up and sinned, right? And you're like, oh, all I got is this pigeon because I can't afford a lamb. Oh, I just messed up. And you know, Aaron says, All right, give it here, you know, and you sacrifice it and comes back and like, the Lord has accepted you. Whew. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> I'll be back in another, be back with another pigeon in ten minutes, huh? <laughs> so in chapter twenty, both Miriam and Aaron have died. Moses' death is recorded in Deuteronomy 34. All this is within a year. Miriam, who you could say represents the prophets, couldn't lead them into the promised land. Aaron, who represents the priests, couldn't lead them into the promised land. Moses, who represents the law, couldn't lead them into the promised land. Only Yeshua, that's Jesus, could lead them into the promised land. That's good. Wow. Jesus is our great eternal high priest and king who gives us comfort. And he's our king who not only leads us in the promised land, but he keeps us in his eternal peace in the glorious promised land. So, Aaron dies. Edom says you can't come through our land. Chapter 21. The king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atharium. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was called Hormah. All right. So 38 years earlier, um, after they refused to go in the promised land, the Lord told them that no one over 20 would live to go possess the promised land. Right. Then after that, the Lord brought a plague. And he killed those 10 bad spies plus a bunch of other people. And then Israel decided, oh, we messed up. We're going to go conquer the land and we're going to go to battle without God. And then the Amalekites and the Canaanites defeated them in this exact same place called Horma. So they had came full circle. But they just received this disappointing blow by Edom refusing to allow them passage. And then the Canaanites came out and attacked them again and took a bunch of the Israelites prisoners of war. But unlike the last time, this time, Israel prayed and made a vow. They vowed to the Lord that they would wipe them out if the Lord gives them victory. Now, Unlike the Edomites, the Canaanites were on God's list of peoples for destruction. So the Lord listened to their prayers because they made it with a heart given in complete obedience to his will. See, whenever we pray with our heart in agreement with the Lord's will, his answer is always yes. Yes. Now, the Canaanites, they were wicked, they were immoral, they were devil-worshipping, and they were a cancer upon the earth, and the Lord had to remove them. If you want to learn about the Canaanites, just read Leviticus 18, that whole chapter. And when you get done with it, you'll be like, yeah, they need to be wiped out. But before God pronounced his judgment on them, he gave them almost 500 years to repent. In Genesis 15, the Lord told Abraham that the sins of the Canaanites were not yet filled, but his descendants would be his instrument used to destroy them. Now, he told that to Abraham. Israel, Isaac, or Jacob, I mean, went into Egypt almost like 100 years later. Then they spent 430 years in Egypt. They came out of Egypt and wandered around in the desert for 40 years. So this was like 500 years that these people had to repent. And God was calling them to repentance. Anyway, the first time um, 
Israel, the parents, attempted to conquer the Canaanites in this place, but it was in disobedience and they were defeated. This time they came in faith and the Lord gave them victory. They vowed not to keep any of the spoils of war. This would be a complete sacrifice, giving all the cities completely to God by utterly destroying them. And so they called it Horma, the region. All those cities was called Horma. Horma means to place or to put under the ban. And that literally means devoted and dedicated to God for extermination and complete destruction. Okay? Now, check this out. The thought of putting things under the ban is important because... As Christians, putting something under the ban means you fight until you get all of it. The same way a doctor fights to get all of the cancer. There are some people, some places, some things in our lives that we have to put under the ban in order to move forward in God. Ban, B-A-N. That may mean pouring out all the alcohol. For me, it meant flushing all the drugs when I owed the wrong person the money for it. But it's like, well, it's either deal with him or deal with God. Flush. Hey, dude, I ain't got your money. What? Hey, man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay you back or whatever. We think I am a punk? No, but I'm out. And I can pay you back or you can handle it the way you want to. Click. Kim said, you're crazy. But God said, quit. It could mean, well, in the old days, burning those magazines, right? <laughs> or smashing up those devil records. Because, see, you think about it. You, you're, you're like, okay, this, this thing, this, this issue, you know, it's, it's, it's a sin in my life. I got this stash of magazines. I'm going to go give them to somebody else. No, that's not what you do. <laughs> right? You got to put them under the ban. You got to burn them. You got to get rid of it totally, destroy completely. And it means sometimes separating yourselves from friends and relatives who are still in the mix that you have to stay away from. See, it's by destroying those things, it makes them unusable to anyone else. Right? If I got people in my life, I got relatives, right? Let's just say. And I know they're partiers. And I know that they're whatever. Okay, I'm cool. God has delivered me. I don't have a problem with it no more. And I got a brother in church, and I know he's on the teeter-totter in this area. I'll be like, hey, let's go over to my family's house. Okay, well, that's cold-blooded. Yeah. I just done set him up, right? So I got to put him under the ban. Because if I stumble my brother, man, that's a boomerang for me. You know what I mean? I used to tell myself, I'm not going to do drugs no more. I'm just going to connect people. <laughs> Okay, that lasted. <laughs> so you got to put things under the ban. Verse 4. After they destroyed those cities of the Canaanites, then Israel journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and spoke against Moses, saying, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Okay. <clears throat> they ain't learned a lesson yet. But at this point, Israel had come further than they had ever been before. 
they were on the border of the promised land. I mean, they were so close, they could taste it. But Edom turned them away, and then they were attacked, but then they had a great victory. But since Edom turned them back after this victory, they had to turn back and head out into the desert in order to circumvent Israel, uh, Edom. Now, because I don't have any maps, I was trying to think, how, 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 how would this look? Okay, let's say that we're, we're in San Diego County, right? And we are on the five and we are going to go conquer Los Angeles County. Then we get to Orange County and they say, you can't come through here, right? <laughs> I was like, but it's right there. No, hell no. You, I mean, not hell no. But no, you can't. <laughs> you can't come through here. I'm going to delete that out the tape, right? And so, I'm sorry. after 40 years of wandering around, you and all your millions got to head back south down to five, all the way to Chula Vista to get on the 125 so that you can get on the eight to get on the 15 so that you can go around Orange County to get to Los Angeles County. And it's all desert. So this is this is just this is just kind of like what they what they what they're going through, right? You get what I'm saying? So they're complaining against God and against Moses because they're following the cloud. Why are they complaining against God? Because they're following the cloud. That's why I don't agree with Moses was in disobedience when he turned away from Edom. They are following the cloud. God said, you cannot touch Edom. So we're going to make a detour. Back out into the desert. So they had to turn back out and head out into the desert in order to circumvent Edom. As a result, Israel became discouraged because of the way, because of the route, because of the detour. I mean, the victory over the Canaanites, that was a mountaintop high. They were like celebrating. We haven't had a victory since way back when Moses first struck the rock, like 40 years ago. But now because of the Edomites, who we can't touch, we got to go back into the wilderness. That's that depressing valley after the victory. You know, for us, we had these spiritual victories. We had these mountaintop highs. But we can't crumble when God sends us on the long route through the valley. Because the valleys are for a purifying purpose. Jeremiah 12, 5 says, the Lord says, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how, you can, how can you contend with the horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted they wearied you, how will you do in the flood plain of the Jordan? Okay, so God is saying, look, he's saying, check this out. You were dealing with people on foot and they wore you out. What are you going to do when you get engaged in combat with people on horses? And while the Jordan is at its low point and you got tired, what are you going to do when it overflows its banks and the wild animals start running into your villages? Quit crying like a punk. That's what he's saying. So they start whining and complaining against God. And, you know, they throw Moses in there. Like little brats. And then they call the Lord's provisions detestable and worthless. God had provided them with water from the rock and bread from heaven and kept them completely healthy for 40 years. And now they're telling God, we detest everything you've been doing because it ain't enough and we deserve more. 
I'm entitled to more. So give it to me. My daughter has this thing, and I think she does it on purpose. She says she doesn't do it on purpose, but I think she does it on purpose. Whenever we leave the house, she manages not to leave with her own bank card. <laughs> and then she always wants to make a pit stop. Yeah. And then before getting out the car, oh, but I need that. What you mean, oh, but you need? Well, I don't have my money. Well, why don't you have your money? Because any other time you keep your bank card inside your phone that you never let leave your side, but now <laughs> your bank card ain't in your phone. I'm still trying to figure that one out. She got me again last night. I need some headphones. Okay, well, we'll get them. All right, no money. By the way, can we stop at McDonald's? <laughs> then, uh, but I'm only... 16, you have to take care of me. I want to see the handbook that has that in writing because I know a whole lot of kids ain't got parents taking care of them. Stop taking advantage of me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stick to the notes. So, God, we detest this loathful bread that you have given us. Okay, the bread was already like, you know, honey buns, Krispy Kreme donuts, and it was every nutritional need that they had, right? And, and for most of them, this is all they had ever seen because the older generation died off, and then these were people who were born in the wilderness, so they grew up with the manna. And this rock following them around, giving them water. Right? And they're like, this ain't enough. Okay. It wasn't that it wasn't enough. It just wasn't enough variety. The menu had hamburgers. They wanted steak and shrimp. But if God gives you hamburgers, be happy. Right? Because it could give you dry rice. So they're complaining against God, which is something their parents didn't really have the courage to do. The parents always complained against Moses and Aaron. They complained against God and Moses, right? So they're whining about this detestable, worthless bread. Verse 6, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. Okay, and think about your history. Egypt gets destroyed. We whine. People get swallowed up by the earth. Fire comes down, burn people up. Plague strike people, and we still got a bad attitude with you. So God sent them some snakes that bit them up. Now, they were fiery serpents. Um... I don't think the snakes were like on on fire, like, you know, like, right? But I think their bite injected poison like the flames of hell burning people up from the inside out. And then they die. Now, remember, God is always moving every piece on the board. And he's always using every circumstance to purify. Well, right now, he's still cleaning the weeds out from amongst his people before they cross the Jordan to possess the land. For God, nobody whose heart wasn't right with the Lord would enter the promised land. And this was another blessed subtraction. Verse 7. Therefore, the people came to Moses saying, we have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Okay, so at least this time they're like, okay, that was a dumb idea. We sinned. We confess. We're sorry. 
basically they realized that the stove was hot and cried out in repentance. But Moses, man, he had the heart of a true shepherd. A heart that loves the Lord's sheep and he interceded for him. I mean, think about it. What would you have done? It's been 40 years of wandering around in the desert with you hard-headed people. And I don't get to go in the promised land because of you hard-headed people. Now you talking mess about God and he sent you these snakes and they bite you and you like, pray for us. Okay, I'm going to pray about praying for you. <laughs> Let me go take it to the Lord about praying for you. Oh, the snake bit you? Oh, roll Charlie around, roll him around, roll him around. He, right? But Moses begins to intercede for him immediately. For us, sometimes the Lord has to bring some fire into our lives to get that stubborn heart and that stubborn attitude in check so that you can get your mind right. But in order to do that, we have to acknowledge our fault and repent. If you can never admit that you are in the wrong when it comes to God, you can never repent. And you will stay filled with bitterness. You'll stay filled with the venom of the fiery serpent that's bit you. And it's just a slow, agonizing death. It's a miserable life. And that life makes not only you miserable, but everybody around you. You guys know miserable people? Yeah. And when they come around, it's just like, ugh. And, and, and your power levels, you can see your power level going like this. That's what unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, pride, unwilling to admit that I'm wrong and God is right does. Verse 8, then Moses then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Okay, so this bronze serpent that Moses made, about seven, eight hundred years later, there's a king named Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was a godly king. I mean, he was like on fire for God. He was like everything that was not of God in the land. He was tearing it down. But it says this, King Hezekiah removed the pagan worship places, broke down their sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For in those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan, a bronze thing. So they had turned this bronze serpent into an idol and were worshiping it. Now, you think that's bad. The Catholic Church claims to have pieces of this bronze serpent in one of their churches, and you get to pay to go see it and kiss it and bow down to it. It's a relic. I don't know where they claim they got it, but you know. Anyway, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had an ungrateful, entitled attitude and chose to believe the serpent when he convinced them that everything God gave them was not enough. They were in the Garden of Eden. They had everything. Well, Adam's sin and the snake were judged in the Garden. When the children of Israel began to complain against the Lord because they were not content with everything he was giving to them, giving to them, their freedom from slavery, water out of rock, manna from heaven, a cloud and a fire pillar and everything else. And they still complain. He sent out some fiery snakes to bite them. But then they cried out for his mercy. 
And when they cried out, the Lord told Moses to make a snake out of brass, and brass is for judgment. He says, set this brass snake on top of a pole and raise it high so that everyone could see. Everyone who looked at it wouldn't die from their bite because the Lord would heal them. Turning back death unto life. Now. Some people. They were told, hey, you know, you down there, you bit, you rolling around screaming, ah, look at the pole. Look at the snake that Moses, that's stupid. That's not going to help me. I need science, right? I need what the experts say. I'm not going to believe that. Okay, well, burn up and die. Other people. Okay, well, that sounds stupid. I don't know how it's going to help. But I'm going to believe it anyway, and I'm going to look. And because of that look of faith, they were saved from a painful death. That fiery snake made by Moses in the Old Testament was a picture of Christ. The serpent brought the curse and the serpent was judged. But Christ took our place on the cross and was judged for our sin. Look into Christ on the cross for judgment of my sin because I'm a sinner. For some people it's foolish. First off, they can't believe that they're a sinner. I'm a good person. I haven't murdered anybody. Okay. I'm a good person because I'm better than him. But you're not a good person. God doesn't save good people. He saves the ungodly and the sinner. Until Jesus opened up the scriptures and gave us clarity of the purpose of this, it really made no sense. In John 3, talking to Nicodemus, Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You have to look to the cross in faith because every last one of us has been bitten by the fiery serpent that struck in the garden. Sin is that burning, slow death that plagues us all. But there's no cure except the cross. Now, you can think that's foolish. You ever sit in church and look around and think that, are we all crazy? Like, we all believe the same thing? Right? In my mind, it kind of goes to those cult movies where they're like, oh, brother. You know. <laughs> But then I think about my life, and it's like, yeah, this is real. Yeah. <laughs> this is real because nothing about the way I used to think and believe I know is absolutely not true. And some of the stuff that I've been through, that wasn't by chance or luck. That was God. And then look at the friends I got now. Normal people. <laughs> I got a whole different set of friends. Now when people say my name, it's not like, you know, I had to speak one time at a church. 
and you know, the pastor introduced me, whatever, I came out, everybody clapped. And I was like, this is weird. <laughs> First you said my real name. Everybody's clapping. And I'm not in a police car. Okay, all of that don't happen. My real name, applause, police car, all goes together with me. And you're happy to see me. God does that. I led a Bible study for four years in the federal district attorney, prosecuting attorney, penthouse, and had the key to the password to get in this house. I'm like, this is only Jesus. <laughs> Like, I'm leading a Bible study in this dude's house in a penthouse. I got the password. No crime going on. And he's a federal prosecutor and likes me. This is Jesus. So you can tell me it ain't real if you don't want if you want to, but I know. The point is this. We can be entitled or we can be grateful. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word today. We, we thank you for your blessings. And anyone, Father, who may realize that they need you. Just tell the Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. And thank you for receiving me as your child. Lord, we praise you, we bless you, we glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.